Welcome back, everyone. We walked through just some of the stuff on getting things checked in and checked out. We now have a module, module four, which covers Git fundamentals. Now we're doing part A because we're bumping up against a lunch uh, meal break, but we wanted to see if we could get some of the stuff in before the meal. Yep. We got ahead of ourselves on a, on a couple of these. Uh, during lunch, we're gonna be answering some questions and helping people out. Mm -hmm. um, but I do wanna stress, um, we're not gonna be able to walk through everybody's um, potential problems, but keep asking questions about how do I do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. as well as if you're blocked on something. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we'll come back in and we'll then show you. We had a great question and we're gonna address it right in the, in the first part of the demo next when we get into initializing Git repos. Yep. All right, so Git fundamentals, it's a different animal than other version control systems and we have to discover why. So let's head back to the slides. And first thing we're gonna cover is snapshots. Mm -hmm. Git is different. And, and I'll discuss the old ones, then I'll turn it over to you. Old, that's not a nice way to say it. I'll discuss how traditional and other version control systems work it, and then I'll pass it over to you to discuss some snapshots, if that's fair. Yep, yep. So in a normal version control, See, there I go again. In a historical, <laughs> centralized, other version control other systems. Version control other systems. version control systems. In other version control <laughs> systems. Um, <laughs> what you find is that over time, there's all of these check-ins. And so if you look at the slide here, you see version one, version two, version three, version four. We, we're just kind of incrementing our versions as we go. And if you look on the left-hand side, we've got a file. File A, B, and C. We have those three files. And on our first commit, there they, there they are, all of those things, just the files themselves. Now, what happens is I make some edits, and I check in those edits, but I only change files A and C. So all a, normal, uh, all a centralized version control system is going to do, in most cases, is say, aha, I'm going to take the deltas of those files and just store the deltas, because that's the difference between these two. Now, underneath the covers, it looks like it's storing the whole thing, um, but it really is only storing the differences in A and C. We're only catching A and C. In other words, the file B is really not in there. So if I go and get that particular version, I'll see file B in there. Mm -hmm. But the version control under the covers is incrementing these changes. Now TFS, to do optimization for getting, actually inverts those, and it, it actually puts the delta before. So the latest is the file, and then it does a reverse <laughs> delta. But ah, that's just under the covers. That's just perf things. Yeah. And then as we check in over time, we're storing all of these deltas. Did you mm -hmm. want to add anything to that, James? No, that, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really str pretty straightforward. Yep. So with Git, it works a little differently. So um, with the version one, we still have the exact same thing that we would have in other version control systems, where the files are just stored as is in the version control. Now with version two, when we just modified the file A and file C, we are taking a snapshot of every single one of those files, right? So rather than storing the delta, we actually take a full version of the file. Now that might freak some people out a little bit because now we're storing full versions yep. every single time. Um, but that's how, it, that's how it stores things, right? Sure. And under the covers, it does yeah, a lot it does of optimizations. A lot of optimizations. But for our sake of, of looking at commits and that sort of thing, each commit will be a full snapshot of the entire directory. So we have an entire snapshot of file A, B, and C because that's all that we have in the directory. Now, why would you need a full snapshot? I don't, I don't understand. Why not just store the changes? Why the full snapshot? So when you look at commits, you actually pull in and out these snapshots. That's how you check out the different commits rather than getting the full thing. It also helps us with history, right? We can look at a history and we see the exact file as is okay. rather than traversing the deltas. And also when you're pushing these up and sharing code with lots of other people, it's also going to be important that we have that full version, what that version is. Yep. And as you'll see later, this, it's a, uh, it's a hash of that, that yeah. file that it yeah, actually yeah. stores to identify it exactly. It's, yep, uniquely. It, it's, it's interesting. In reading some of the stuff about, about Git on these, these versions and these snapshots, um, it, 
I forget where I read it. It was, I believe, Wikipedia on the article. So, yeah. uh, but it has a quote from Linus saying, you know, I, Linus Torvalds is the creator of Git. I, we yep. should have addressed that. The same creator of Linux created Git as part of the, the move from a, a, a version control system called BitLocker they were using that was going to start charging, et cetera. And so he, Linus just ended up rewriting or writing a version control system called Git. And when he talks about why some of the decisions were made and why we have these versions that look like this, it's not just because we need to share things in a distributed fashion. Um, he said, <laughs> I love the quote, and I, I'm going to mangle it, but the, the bottom line is, I, hey, I knew how to build file systems, right? I built <laughs> Linux, I understood file systems. So I built something that felt like a file system. Mm -hmm. And Git feels a lot like a file system, much more so than other version control systems. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, so much so that when you look at Git, you can almost think of when you, when you take a branch, it's like taking a copy of an entire directory and moving it to another directory. Mm -hmm. And every snapshot or every time you check in, it's like taking a, uh, a zip of that directory and archiving it yep. somewhere. Uh, kind of crazy. Uh, it doesn't we'll quite work that way, but no, no, no it doesn't work not like at all. That but, at all. but that's kind of how you can think of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, back back to you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at piece. all. Let's uh, go back to the slides there. So now, as we go on to version three, only C, only file C was changed. So we can see that the snapshot of A one and the original B is still in that version, right? Mm -hmm. We're still taking a snapshot and putting in that version. What that means under the covers is a little different, but we can see that each version has a full snapshot of every single file, rather than doing a delta and storing the delta for that version. Yep. Let's talk about repos. Yeah. I think that that first bit, it, it's a little confusing, and most of the times I teach it, it does come across as confusing, yeah. until we get to actually looking at the repos and what a branch looks like. Yeah. And we're not going to get to a branch until after, after the, the, the uh, meal after break. The meal. But, uh, Let's go. Yeah. How do we get a repository? This is best done with a demo, but I want to do a couple slides just to level set. Yep. Um, git init creates a repository right inside the... Right wherever you're Right at. wherever you type git init. You could type git init foo, and it would create a, a directory called foo, but we'll get there. And we saw cloning, which was git clone. Clone says, hey, we've already got a repo. We want to clone it. We want another copy of it. Mm -hmm. Is that yep. fair? And yep. we'll go into some demonstrations in there. Now... Tracked, untracked, unmodified, modified, staged. Yeah. What's all this mean? So essentially we get into what we call the working directory. So when you have a, a Git repository, um, you'll notice that in that repository folder, the root folder, there is a hidden folder, unless you know you have un, you know, unhide hidden folders, right? <laughs> but it'll say .git, and that's, that's essentially the repository. Um, everything outside of that is what we call the working folder. Um, basically, what version of the files we have checked out. Um, those files can get into different states. They can be either tracked or untracked. And the three stages that we saw, the three stages of the files, are part of the tracked files. So tracked files are basically files that Git is going to be tracking, right? Makes sense. <laughs> it's the one we've added to version control. Like yes. in any other system, you add it to version control, there it is, version control is managing it. Things in your you know, debug.bin directory, mm -hmm. or debug slash bin, yeah, it's not tracking those. Yep. Yeah. Now, untracked is the opposite of that. Basically files that are not being tracked by Git. Um, these would be uh, you know, binaries that you don't want to add. If you're using NuGet, you probably don't want to push in the NuGet packages. You'll probably restore them on builds, things like that, right? Files that you don't want to push up to the repository are untracked files. Now, with tracked files, you can have three different stages, and we've hit on it a little bit before, um, but those three stages are basically staged, unstaged, and what, what's the third one? Modified. Modified. Ready to be staged. Ready to be staged, right? So unstaged or un, uh, unmodified, yep. I think is actually what, it, what the correct term is, is basically a file that we have, but we haven't modified. We've checked it out. We have it in our working directory. We haven't touched it or we've just read it, you know. Um, modified means that we have modified the file. Um, and staged is when we stage the file. Now when we commit a file, it goes back to unmodified, right? So basically you can think of it as a checked in file as an unmodified file. Uh, a, a pending change would be an a modified file and staging, it's kind of semi quasi checked out, right? It's yeah. ready to be checked or committed. Yep. Um, now, 
let's step back a little bit and look at files that have just been added, right? So when we first add a file, it's not going to be tracked, right? So what we have to do is we actually have to add it to be tracked in order to actually commit it, right? So that's the, the weird case where we add a file, it's still in the untracked stage. Yeah, when you say add, you mean create a new Create one, a new file. Create a new yes, file and thank put you. it in the working directory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Create a new file, put it in the working directory. We then have to add it to stage it before it becomes tracked. Right? So those are the three, the three stages are really unmodified, modified, and staged. And when we're, when we're going in inside of uh, PoshKit, that you can think of them as red or green. <laughs> you know, yeah. Really, uh, un, um, 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 everything else is, is, is just is in the red state as well as any modified files. They stay in the red state. And then once you've staged them, everything turns nice and green. Yep. And if you stage just some of them and leave some, you'll see it split. You'll see green and red. And that's what we call a clean working directory, right? Yeah. And we always kind of want to have a clean working directory. We want it to be green before we start work and when we finish work. Yeah. So here's the life cycle we go through. And this is maybe even better seen once we start walking through it. But, but uh, you know, once we add the file, it's untracked. We have untracked on the far left, and then the right three are tracked. Yep. Um, you add the file. Um, it goes into the unmodified state. You edit it. It goes into modified. Stage it to staged. Commit. Um, right on back to unmodified. Yep. And you just kind of spin in that loop. Mm -hmm. You can actually remove the file as well to make it untracked. Yep. Something you yep. want to pull out. That's kind of the way it kind of just walks through. Yeah. To find something, git status. Yep. You showed us that once. What does git status kind of give us? So git status will kind of tell us what's going on with our working directory. What's, what's being tracked, what's being untracked, what's modified, what's been staged, what's ready to commit, that sort of thing. Um, what's really great about git status is that it will also tell us what commands we can run to do different things. Um, such as, let's say we modified a file that we accidentally, we didn't want to save, right? Yep. How do we unmodify that or put that back into the unmodified state? Um, it will tell us, right? There's the, the second command on the PowerPoint there. It just tells us git checkout dash dash the file name and it will discard any changes, <laughs> yep. which is awesome, right? So, like, and, and by the way, if you don't want those tips, you know, you're a git master, you yeah. can remove those tips if you like. I yeah. like having them. Right, right I love having them. They're, they're great Always reminds me. <laughs> so git status is really kind of telling you what's going on with your working directory. What is the status of our working directory right now? Perfect. Mm -hmm. What on earth is git ignore? So <laughs> git ignore is a file that's used to ignore specific things, right? Um, this is just an example, um, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these examples, but you can basically use expressions to ignore compiled files, certain folders, things that you don't want to check into version control, right? Yeah. Such as if we're using a Visual Studio, a .NET, what, what was it, a WinForms sure. application that you had, it's going to dump some stuff out to the bin folder. We don't want to check that in, right? We don't want to check anything into the bin folder, um, and you can see that that's, you, can, you can add that to your git ignore file. Um, with Visual Studio, when you create a repository or get a repository, it actually automatically adds a git ignore file that has a lot of those things already, already in there. It is. It's pretty it's cool. It's really nice. It's nice to have that yeah. from Visual Studio. It just automatically creates your git ignore and a couple other, a couple other files that are nice to have. So you yeah. don't have to go in and type those in. But why would you do a git ignore? Why not just not add those files? That way, when we, we the references stay the same, right? So if I if I'm working on something and I'm referencing something outside my Git repository, and then Steve comes in and clones that repository, things are probably not going to work for him unless he has it set up just like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other reason I like Git ignore is I can I can I don't have that when I type Git status. If I've added a bunch of bin file uh, the bin directory, it's going to show up as you know 58 files ready to be added, and I, it, it would stay there all the time. To get to that nice, clean state, git ignore just cuts it all out. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yep. Git ignore. So that brings us to a demo. Are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it on over. You go ahead and hit the demo on the, on the repository. Yep. I might take it back a little bit later and do a demo in Visual Studio. Pop yeah, in Visual that sounds Studio. great. So uh, a big question that I heard a couple times on the Q&A was, how do you initialize a, a repository, and how do you add basically create a repository around a project that you already have. Um, so I'm currently already in uh, uh, my demo repository, so I'm just going to CD back one folder. Um, I, during our break, I just created a quick folder called new repo. 
um, with just fun and index. So these are the HTML files I had in my other repository. Um, notice something here that we don't have the .git folder here yet. And if I actually CD to this folder, new repo, we don't get that posh git heads up display, right? right? We're not currently in a, a git repository. So how do, we do, how do we create a git repository here? Well, we saw in the last, in the last PowerPoint slide that just git in it, and that's it. And by doing that in this folder, it's just gonna create a repository in this folder. Hit that, and it creates the repository. That's how easy it is to just get, just create a Git repository and start versioning files locally. Now, I've got a question. You've got a Git repo now. This is your, it's a Git, it's a, now it's a whole Git repo, but you've got it under C colon, blah, 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 users, James Tupper. I wanna put that in E colon Git or C colon Git. Can I just move that directory around? How do I, what Git commands do I use to move it around? Anything? You can just copy the folder. Whew. You can just copy the folder over. Remember that the Git repository is stored 100% into this Git folder. You'll see it right here. Here's my Git folder and I've popped back over here. Oh, let's see if we can unhide that. We now have our Git folder, right? So as long as we copy that folder, that new repo folder here, we can just copy that wherever we want and we, we automatically have that. It keeps all the settings, everything in it. So that's something to watch for um, with your Git repos. Um, don't delete new repo thinking, oh, I can just delete the directory and get the, my version control back. Um, nope. It's gone unless you've pushed it to some other place like uh, pushed it up to VSO yeah. or, or TFS. Yep. So that Git repo, that, that Git directory has got all the stuff in there. Yep. Now, I've created this and it says I have two, two files in here that are being untracked, right? So we need to add those files. So Git add... And I'm gonna do a little shortcut here which just adds all the files. Um, and that's just dash, dash capital A. And when I hit that, that'll add both of those files and put them in the, into the staging area. And if I type git status, right, it'll tell us we have two files, changes to be committed, right? They're new files, fun.html and index.html. Um, and again, it comes up with this great hint right here that says if we want to unstage them, we write git rm dash dash cached file. So if we say git rm and I just type in index, right, we now have, we can see that we have one staged file and one unstaged file, right? And we see that in the heads up display and if we type git status again, we note here that we have untracked files and changes to be committed, right? Those are our, this is how, we can see our different states here. So this is kind of crazy because now if I do a a git commit, do I get my changes to index.html in that commit? Not at all, right? Whoa. Yeah, so okay. we something to be very aware of is that when you do a git commit, you will only be committing the files or changes that you have staged at that particular time. Um, another cool thing is that, let's say I staged fi the fun.html, I can still go edit fun.html and it can still be untracked. Now, if I didn't add that, and pushed and committed or didn't, didn't stage those new changes and then committed, it would have my previous changes, right? So if I go in here and just say um, notepad fun.html and let's just say I'm gonna remove this space, hit save, um, hit enter here, they're now both, one's modified and one's, one's untracked at all. And we also have one staged. So we can see that we can see three different states here. <laughs> and even yeah. fun is doubly. Yeah. Even fun is. is Seems vastly confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's not green, it's not getting checked in. Yeah. That, essentially. Committed. Basically. Okay. And, and you'll see that green here. So let's go ahead and add everything again. Add in them all, hit get status one more time, and they're both green. They're both ready to be committed. Okay. So let's go ahead and commit those. Oops. Again, this is only going to commit it to my local repository, right? So we've created this repository around these files, we've added these files to the repository themselves, but we haven't pushed them anywhere. Um, we're not gonna get into that quite yet, uh, but this is how you create a repository. And this repository can now be shared once you put it public. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. I, I it, just get in it and we're in. 
Um, now we've got a Git repository. It's all local. If you know I tripped and fell and broke my laptop, I'd lose all of my history. I'd yep. lose everything. You want to get it somewhere else. And we'll be definitely talking about that. But for the folks who want to kind of like play along and kind of and, and, and work through some of this, um, having everything local makes it easy because you don't have to go set up a, a, an external repository and push into it. We will be getting into push and pull when we hit remotes in great detail. But right now, yep. let's keep everything just local and just hope our hope our uh, you know our Azure data center doesn't you know somebody doesn't drop something <laughs> on our hard drive or something. Oh, and, and one more thing. So when we've created this this repository, notice that I'm on the master branch. So when you create a repository, it always creates a branch called master by default. Um, and that is kind of the de facto branch, the, the, the blessed branch in the repository. You can rename this branch or use a different branch, but that's just the default branch that comes out. It's called master. Just something to note. Awesome. Are you going to show us? It, you can pop on over if you want to see how we, get, we create things in Visual Studio. Absolutely. Yep. Come on us. over. Uh, let's take a look at Visual Studio. If, if I'm in here on any of these things, I can, I can click my connect, local Git repositories. I want to add one. If I want to, uh, another one, we can clone it. Or I can just go up here and say new, uh, my new repo. Create. Ta-da. <laughs> All done. That was easy. Um, <laughs> we, we can right click, open that in File Explorer, and we can see there, there, there's, there's nothing in here. There's a couple uh, little uh, text documents, nothing. The Git ignore files. The Git ignore files. If, if we look at those, I'll, I'll show you what those look like in a moment. Um, in fact, let's go to view um, and make sure that file uh, name extensions. We si see that and we see the file name extensions. There we go. So the Git attributes, Git ignore. Yep. This just created, blah, dropped right in there. I, I'm curious. Let's open up one of these Git ignores and uh, pop it into Notepad and see what it looks like. Visual Studio saves you energy and effort, and, and it just kind of takes all these things that you might have to ignore and dumps them in here. Now, if you need to have them, you know, go figure it out. You'll need to go in and change it. But like, notice, debug and release. If I highlight this section, uh, capital D, lowercase d, using some regex type stuff yep. in here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gets rid of things that are user specific, like, um, the, uh, the solution files that are the user-based things that configure your uh, Visual Studio when you look at it. As you scroll down, NuGet package type stuff are all ignored. Test results, all these types of log and temp files. So you can come in here and change all these or change any of them, mm -hmm. but by default, it just creates them for you. Yep. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I love it. I, mm -hmm. I do too. Uh, there's also a git attributes file. Um, not much in here that's, uh, that's, that's not commented. Everything's commented out. But you can change the behavior of things. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, if you want solutions to be merged only as binary, you can check that out like that. That forces a binary, binary style merge so you don't run into conflicts. It's more of an overwrite. Um, uh, how do you want to normalize text endings? Um, mm -hmm. If you want to set that to automatic, uh, it actually is set to automatic on this case. So it'll yep. automatically normalize all those. Lots of different different things. Mm -hmm. So all of those are available as some of your Git attributes. Um, and, and there's my new repo. And frankly, if I just went back into my PowerShell and went into uh, cd dot dot, looked at my directory, you'll see I've got my new repo. I can go into new repo, and there it is. Mm -hmm. I've got two files ready to be checked in, my git ignore and, and my git, git attributes. attributes. Mm -hmm. Why would you put the git ignore file in why wouldn't you ignore the gitignore file? So if you ignore the gitignore file, that means that if someone else grabs the repository and let's say runs a build and puts some stuff into the debug folder, that might get checked in. Oh, if they don't yes. have a gitignore file as well. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. So there I am. I can look at my directory and I just see those two things and yep. I, can, I can commit it. Creating one is that easy. Um, when you want to create a new one, if you want to add one to an existing repo, you just hit add, type in the path to it, and it basically just runs git init inside of there and gives you that git subdirectory. Yep. Awesome. That's it. That's it. That's how easy it is from Visual Studio. It just pops right in. New one, add an existing one, clone one. Um, we, we've got some options here. You can hide some of the existing repositories, but it's that fast, that yeah, easy. Really easy. That's my local one. Yep. Great. So. We now have a repository. We've pulled down that repository. Um, we, or we've initialized the repository, rather. We've started making changes. You've showed off some of those changes to the repository. Is there anything else we need to know about repos? 
This is a pretty simple stuff before, yeah. before lunch, before we get into what makes a change set or what makes a commit. <laughs> no, nothing good? yet. Yeah, I think we're good. All yeah. right. Let's keep going one more step, if we can, back to PowerPoints, and we'll talk about one more thing, which will let you gnaw on it before we get into the actual demo yeah. on how to solve it. So if we head back to the PowerPoints on my deck, um, we're going to see... The demo slide, and what is a commit? Now, commits are different, yep. and we've talked about snapshots, but what actually goes into a snapshot? We've yep. talked about what hashes. What happens? We've thrown some stuff into there. Whoa! Lots of stuff going on Lots here. of stuff going Lots on. Lots of stuff going and on. James, I'm going to leave it to you, because there's 9.8CA9. What on earth is all that? Yep. Fill me in. So, Explain this to me. It, it, <laughs> Essentially, we have um, a bunch of objects that are linked to one another, right? Um, so when we look at the commit object, that's what's stored in a commit object. It's not this big object that has a file in it, right? What it is, is it's a commit. It has its own commit hash. And what the hash is, is it basically takes the commit, runs it through a, I think it's a SHA-256 hash. And a SHA-1 hash. SHA-1 hash, sorry. SHA-1 hash, and it gives us a 40 character 40 character hash value. Um, these are very unique. The chances of hitting the same hash in the same repo is unbelievably, small. Un unbelievably small. So within this commit, we have our author, our committer, which are usually the same. We'll talk about that more later. You can kind of ignore that and just say author. Um, we'll see the commit comment, and then we'll see tree. What tree is, it's another object within within Git. Um, and, and tree, you can somewhat think of it as a directory, basically, a directory that holds other objects in it. So what it does is it points to a tree, which the tree itself has its own hash, right? Again, every single object in Git is run through the SHA-1, and it gets its own hash. And that's how it references things across the board. So is that a way, then, you could tell a difference between potentially two different things? Uh, I mean, when you push up to merging history or whatnot, all it has to do to see if they're different is just compare the hashes. Yeah, exactly, right? And that's another, that's a good point, because if you look at the hashes, if two things actually have the same hash, it doesn't rewrite it, it just references the hash, yeah. right? It's the same object. So now if we look at the tree, we can see that within it we have basically blobs. And what blobs are are, right, are files that we want to take snapshots of. Um, and those are, basically it says blob, hash, and then the name of the file, right? So we can see blob, reference the hash of it, this is the name of the file. What we can also have in there are other tree objects, which then also have more blobs in them. And that's how you kind of get subdirectories and folder structures within a commit. So when you create a commit, what you see here is a commit object, which has a hash. Within that, we have our author, our committer, uh, the tree that's it's pointing to, right? The root directory tree, um, and the comment. And then we also have the tree object, which has references to other blobs or other trees. And then we also have our blobs, which just have the 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 contents of the file in it. And those are run through hashes and as well. every one of these is hashed. So what yeah. I'm hearing you say is that if I don't change a blob, in order for me to take a snapshot, all I have to do is just store the hash. I, it, yep. Because we've got the blob stored somewhere else with that hash. Just, just store, store the, the hash. hash. Obviously, it hasn't changed. Yep. But if it's modified, then I might have to store some more data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Why is this important? This is really important when we start talking about about branches and, and just committing in general, understanding what a commit is so that we can understand what we are doing when we do commit and pushing up to other repositories and sharing code and contributing to projects. Yeah, it's, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna second that. If you don't understand a commit, this commit is a standalone thing. And I wanna stress that. The commit itself, it's got its own hash, it's got its own snapshot of what's going on in that working directory. The whole thing's in there. That whole snapshot is there. And so you can see how, we'll see how this relates to branches just after the meal break, mm -hmm. which it's, it's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. All right, what's a commit? I think you nailed it on yep. these things. And uh, we can go through a little bit. It's a pointer to a snapshot. Yep. So we so have that, that object, tree, that tree object. Yep, it's a pointer it, we to just that. point to the tree object, yep. the, direct, the root directory. Yep. Um, it's got, uh, oh, pointers to parents. 
Yes, which we'll get into in a second, but, okay. or, or after, the, after the meal break. But it also has pointers to parent or parents multiple, depending on, you'll, we'll see that when it has multiple parents, it's, it's a, a merge commit. And we'll see how that works as well. Then it's got the tree object, which is just basically that working directory that we yep. talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the blobs, the virgin, vir virgin. versioned files. Yep, and, and everything's checksummed. Everything is run through the hash, and everything is referenced by that hash. So if you get corruption, you're going to know about it right away. Yep. Because the hashes won't match. Yep. All right. What if you have multiple commits? So this is where, let's, let's take it, go up one view, and we can see that that commit is basically that huge diagram. Each one of those commits is that big diagram we just saw. So the tree, uh, the blobs, all that stuff. But here we're just showing the commit object itself. Um, and we can see that snapshot A is basically our first commit. It doesn't have a parent. It has a tree, author, comments, or committer, and, and the commit comment or message. Um, move on to the next one. It's the exact same thing, except it has a parent reference, right? It references the previous commit's hash. Basically, that's, that's the start of our directed acyclic graph, right? We start, we reference the parents as we go down the commits. Oops. Good. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for a meal break. Yes. I, 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 I'm glad we got a little bit of this out of the way because yeah. it's kind of, it's, it's some tough stuff. Um, not really that tough yet because you're no. not quite understanding maybe where the branches fit in on all this. However, by getting this first part in, uh, what these snapshots are, you'll be able to more easily understand what branches are. And that's the mm -hmm. biggest difference between Git and other version control systems like TFS or Subversion or any of the other uh, centralized version control repositories. Mm -hmm. So for this meal break, we'll be coming back at the top of the hour, uh, which is, a, I guess, approximately an hour from now, yep. uh, mm -hmm. give or take. And uh, we'll see you then. Yeah, thank you.